Good evening. It's good to be together again virtually. Happy Good Friday to you and your family. Thanks for worshiping with us tonight if you are tuning in. Good Friday marks the climax of Christ's Passion in Holy Week. We get the word passion from the Latin word passio, which means sufferings. And so this week marks the suffering, the sufferings of Jesus, in, which culminates um, at Jesus' death on Mount Calvary. So tonight we worship Jesus through his sacrifice, his ultimate sacrifice, which is his death on the cross. Uh, N.T. Wright wrote an article for Time Magazine last week uh, calling for Christians in this season to lament. And here's what he says. It is no part of the Christian vocation to be able to explain what's happening and why. And he's speaking to this pandemic um, and he continues and he says, in fact, it is part of the Christian vocation not to be able to explain and to lament instead. As the Spirit laments within us, so we become, even in our self-isolation, small shrines where the presence and healing love of God can dwell. So he's basically calling us to lament our losses, our grief, our pain, our confusion, and all the things that this pandemic brings. Because when we do, God meets us there. God meets us in our brokenness. Because this is the weight of Good Friday. This is the weight of why Jesus does what he does on Good Friday, to heal brokenness. And he wants to heal our brokenness. See, before there's a resurrection, there's death. Do you hear that? Before there's a resurrection, there's death. And, and Christ's death is what heals. That's what we get to remember tonight, that the death of Jesus brings healing upon this world. So in the spirit of Good Friday and in the spirit of lament, uh, let us worship Jesus tonight, remembering what he did, remembering his death. At the end of service, we will conclude our worship with partaking of the Lord's Supper. So have those elements ready. Uh, good evening, Risen Church. Uh, my name is Aaron Gaho, and um, I just want to thank you for tuning into our Good Friday service, uh, the online edition. Um, I know these are difficult times, but you know I still am so grateful for um, the opportunities that we can still connect like this. Um, so I just want to encourage you to join with me in singing some songs of worship. you 
Lessons from a Pandemic. My days have become a crash course in what I cannot do, a counterintuitive suspension of arrivals and departures. My husband, son, daughter, and I are stunned to find ourselves grounded like planes on a tarmac. Such a short time ago, we could walk around the block without a face mask. I remember when groceries didn't come to us through delivery windows. We all performed 20 second hand washing sprints several times a day like compulsively disordered surgeons. Prayers, disinfecting wipes, and gloves are the artillery we use to stop a psychopathic virus that threatens our precious lives and loved ones. We know by now that the Calvary isn't coming to help us, but Jesus is. He alone can afford to walk our entire neighborhood. He distributes his own masks and gloves to beleaguered health workers, grocery clerks, janitors, and others who are unable to stay at home. He cries with the bereaved. He provides sustenance to those who have lost their jobs. He has the power and passion to march straight into the death that we are battling so valiantly in lockdown. I often look out my living room window and I think about the viral shadow of death that keeps us sequestered inside. As we move from room to room in our homes, Jesus' goodness and mercy moves with us. His uninhibited love is the kind of shadow that we want. We can afford to be at rest, knowing his death has already repurposed our broken and battle-scarred world. Hey everyone, my name is Jose. My wife Ashley and I have been a part of Risen Church since early last year and we both work for Crew in the work of evangelizing on college campuses and discipling believers in the faith. I will be going through John 18 and 19 during this time. Today we are remembering Good Friday. Every year this comes around, I always forget why it's called Good Friday and why we don't call it Black Friday. Black Friday seems more, more fitting. It was the darkest day in history. On this day, we believe that Jesus, who lived a perfect life, who was fully God and fully man, who raised people from the dead, healed lepers, multiplied bread, was sentenced to death for crimes he did not commit. On the cross, he suffered the full wrath of God for the sins of his people. On that cross, he died the death we deserved in our place. However, today is called Good Friday because he bodily rose from the grave three days later in a decisive defeat of death and sin, proving that he is God, proving that he was really able to and really did atone for our sins. Yet today, in my life at least, it feels like a Black Friday more than it's ever felt. It's the fourth weekend without fellowshipping together. The coronavirus hit harder than any of us could have guessed. And when it hit, it hit our systems, our ways of life, our communities hard. When the first shelter in place came down, I thought it was just going to be a week. But we're still here. And the end of the tunnel seems like it's nowhere in sight. Thus, we today are a church without a building and a family without physical gatherings. Without anywhere to go. What a, what a blessing. I didn't say that on accident. What a blessing that on this day we are a church that can fully focus without distraction or excuses on what happened at Golgotha. So let's enter into the events of this day 2,000 years ago. We begin after Jesus was betrayed by Judas and abandoned by his followers. 
Jesus Christ all alone is sent to face Herod in John 18, 33 through 40. In his trial, Jesus did not defend himself, did not explain what was going to happen, and did not fight against his unjust imprisonment. Other people, people like us, would fight like drowning men. We have all seen the courtroom dramas where the accused is facing death. Oftentimes they start pleading with tears in their eyes, then they become angry, and then they kick and fight as they are taken away. If the person is innocent, we become angry as well. We weep at the injustice. But Jesus, like a lamb being led to the slaughter, protested not, saying, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would have been fighting then that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. And verse 37, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then he was sentenced. In John 19, his punishment and execution is described. He was given a crown made of thorns, which was shoved onto his forehead so the skin could break and the blood could gush forth. He then got scourged. I won't go graphically into detail, but basically he was stripped of his clothes and whipped with iron balls and hooks. Then he was given a royal cloak so the soldiers could bow to him in mockery of him. But that wasn't even the worst of it. His death sentence was a death sentence reserved only for the worst of criminals, rebels and dissenters of Rome, crucifixion. He was, he was given a cross, two heavy planks of wood around 300 pounds, and he was forced to carry the head of it, which was around 125 pounds, around a third of a mile to his execution ground, Golgotha. Proceeding before him was a group of soldiers announcing his crime to everyone around him. Sometime before he got there, the ones that Christian believed to be our God was so weak that a man named Simon was forced to help him carry his cross. When he got there, he was stripped naked. Seven inch spikes were dug into his wrists. He was tied to the cross and raised up before his family, friends, and the mocking shouts of the crowds and soldiers below. Can you imagine it? Can you, can you see it in your mind? The man that healed lepers, silenced thunderstorms, and raised the dead to life, naked and bloody on a cross. Why? Why did this have to happen? I still remember a prayer I once heard from my grandmother that answers this question. It goes like this in Spanish. Por mi culpa, por mi culpa, por mi gran culpa. It's my fault. It's my fault. It's because of my great fault. I don't remember any of the other words to the prayer. I don't remember how it started nor how it ended, but I remember the chest beating. I remember the pain. The contrition that gave weight to the words, weight that was so heavy I can still feel it pressing against me now. And though I didn't quite understand the meaning of this prayer until I came to know Christ in college, I felt that pain too. I remember thinking, something isn't right here. Things aren't the way they're supposed to be. We aren't who we're supposed to be. In the book of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. We, creatures from the dirt, have all told the sovereign king of the universe that we know what's best for our lives. We have all turned away and rebelled from the God that formed us, raised us, and gives breath to our lungs. Thus, we are eternally separated from God and we're destined for an eternity without his love and full of his wrath. Yet, when we didn't even want him, he came for us. Jesus Christ came down and lived the life we couldn't live without. He lived it without any sin. And died the death you and I deserved in our place on that cross. When Jesus was born, he was set on the cross. Every day of his life was en route to this day. It goes deeper than that though. Octavius Winslow said this, So completely was Jesus bent upon saving sinners by the sacrifice of himself, he created the tree upon which he was to die and nourished from infant the men who were to nail him upon the accursed wood. 
so focused, so determined was the Lord to rescue you that he promised it in the garden in Genesis 3, over 300 of the times in the Old Testament, like in Isaiah, and then willfully suffered mockery and brutality in this life on earth. Picking back up in John 19, 28, Jesus says, I thirst. Think about this. The God that formed every single droplet of water that there has ever been is now thirsty but is given sour wine by the people he created in one final affront. In verse 30, he says, it is finished. And he breathes his last breath. This was all for you. This suffering was all because God determined to save a people for himself. He was not a faraway God. He is not the cosmic watchmaker that creates his creation and then step back, steps back never to interact with it ever again. No, he determined it, he promised it, and he actively did it. He suffered for us. Through this death, this sacrifice, perfect for imperfect, good for broken, God for humanity, we are reconciled to our Father in heaven. On this day, God himself gave himself up for you so that in your repentance and in your trust in him, you could be raised to life and become a child of the most high God. Yes, he rose on Sunday. We believe that and we praise that and we glory in that he, he rose in victory. But for today on, on this Good Friday, let's sit in this and think about these two things. First, that our sin was so great that it took God sending his only son to die for us, for us to be reconciled. And second, God so loved you that he paid the price, he paid the highest price to have you. Not for anything we could offer him, but simply because he loved you. Our sin was so great, our brokenness so complete, but Christ, Christ is a greater savior than all of our mistakes, all of the pain we have caused others, all of the pain that others have caused onto us. Christ is enough for us because he did everything it took to have us. Let us go on this fact. Let us think through all the areas that we so fall short of and understand that Christ knew about them all before we were even born and still said, yes, I will go to that cross for you. May we think God for his love for us, like we never have before because of the season that this nation, the season that this world is in. If you do not know Christ, if this is your first time hearing about him, or you've heard about him hundreds of times, but it doesn't do anything for you, I just want to ask this one question. Doesn't the world seem more uncertain than it did only a couple weeks ago? Doesn't tomorrow seem so much farther away than it used to? It may seem like everything has changed, but there is one thing that will never change. Nothing stopped the Savior from sacrificing himself for you. And thus there is nothing more solid nor more deserving of trust in this life and these times than the Lord our God. The Lord who loves you. Get to know him. Seek him out. His word will not come back void. And for all of us, Let's think through all of the people that have let us down. Let's think through all the people that have hurt us and left us alone. And understand that Christ did not falter on his way to his execution. will never leave you. And thus he will never, ever forsake you. He will never leave you alone. He had you in mind. He knows your name. He has loved you with a love everlasting. And he proved that on this day at Calvary. Thank you. Let me, let me pray real quick. Lord God, I just thank you so much that you are so good, that, that, that you loved us, that you have redeemed us, that you show your, your love for us in this way, that while we were still sinners, you died for us. I, I ask that this truth seep into our hearts, that, that, that we mourn this day and, and in the darkest night, Lord, that your word can, can come to us as it does in, in, in pure sweetness and offer us hope and peace and joy and the reconciling of us to you, Sovereign Lord. We thank you and we praise you, amen.
As we close worship tonight, we will conclude by partaking in the Lord's Supper, also known as communion and also known as the love feast. When we partake of this meal around this table, we proclaim all that we've heard. We proclaim all that Jesus has done. We proclaim his sacrifice and his death. This meal is for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. It is for those who have examined their hearts and their lives and confessed their need for Jesus and what he's done. It is for those who repent from the things uh, of the reason why Jesus had to die. It's, it's for those who receive the forgiveness of Jesus available at this table. And it is for those who believe in Jesus' love and his perfect life. If that is you, if that is your conviction, then this table is for you. And I invite you to partake in this table. Let's pray. Father, the history of the church is around the table. For hundreds of years, this is where the people of Jesus met. The gospel spread from one table to the next, from one home to another, all over a meal. The table is a very ordinary place, so routine and everyday. It's easily overlooked as a place of life-changing community, but by setting a table and sharing a meal, we provide a context for which people feel loved, where people feel heard. But Lord, more importantly, this is a place where your spirit can move. It's a place where you meet with us. The practice of eating and drinking is so essential to your kingdom. You ate with the lost, you ate with community, you ate with family and friends, and you eat with us. This meal symbolizes more than just nourishment. It brings people together. And through this shared experience, we see strangers as neighbors and neighbors as family. Through this shared meal, we can access everything in your kingdom, all spiritual blessings in Christ. It is our glimpse into eternity and it is the means into your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and says, this is my body which is broken for you. So take the bread and eat of it. And when you eat of it, remember that this is Jesus' body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is my blood. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So at this time, drink of the wine or of the juice and remember that this is Jesus' blood poured out for you. For as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. It's been so good to worship with you tonight. Uh, we look forward to Sunday where we get to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus because the story of the gospel does not end with Jesus' death, but it ends with an empty tomb and Jesus resurrected. He is our risen Savior. He is our risen Lord. We look forward to Sunday. We look forward to worshiping and celebrating with you then. And so until then, grace and peace to you and your family. We love you. Have a good night.